Are you a student? Do you want to learn the course material easier? Get better grades? Remember the material for the test, for the test, and maybe even after you graduate? Well, I've got some tips for you based on some cold hard science. Hi, welcome back to the channel. Today's video is a little bit of a deviation from the recent project that we've been working on, but I think this is useful information and we're coming into school time, so I think this is important for students to learn and get their hands on, so here it is. If you're new to the channel, I am a cognitive psychologist, PhD, and cognitive psychology, we study how people learn, how people remember, decision-making, problem-solving language, other stuff. You're most concerned with how people learn information and how we remember information, at least for this video. I have some study tips based on cognitive science research, as well as personal advice, although the research is the nicer part. And these tips have helped a bunch of students in classes I've taught, as well as myself. And there are books that you can buy about this, set you back somewhere like 15, 20 bucks, but you're gonna get the same info from me in video format for free. So if you don't feel like you have been properly educated on this after watching this video, feel free to get the books, but try out what I say. It'll change your life, maybe. Uh, there is a caveat with this though. The types of study tips I'm going to talk about are best for things like psychology, biology, art history, I'm trying to think what classes I took that this actually helped for. Um, yeah. Sorts of classes where you need to be able to remember information and sort of like, yes, Wundt was the founder of psychology, Van Gogh painted this painting because of whatever, you know information that you sort of regurgitate. Uh, things like physics or math, where you do need to be able to remember like formulas or how to go through a problem, some of this still applies. But for those really do the problems, do the homework, make sure you understand the process and maybe the logic behind it. And this is a topic for another video, so I'm cutting myself off. Let's get to the studying tips. A lot of students early in their studenting career make the mistake of thinking that all they need to do is read the textbook, reread the textbook, go to class, definitely go to class, read their notes, reread their notes, maybe even recopy their notes, just sort of going over the material over and over and over again in this way. And yeah, that's better than nothing, but really that's not the best use of your time. There's the things we're going to talk about in this video that will help you learn the information better, so faster and with better retention than just rehashing what you've already seen. So here are the techniques that will help. First, study early, study often. What does this mean? This means that instead of cramming for four hours before the exam, maybe the day of, the night before, just nose in your book, going over the material, or maybe even doing some of the techniques we're going to talk about here. So doing that one four hour session, space out the sessions, do one hour four times. And just that switch from spacing out these study sessions will drastically improve your memory for the material. And I mean, I am absolutely guilty of cramming. I got through my physiology class like that in undergrad and I regret it. I don't remember anything. I remember some of the things we talked about, but beyond that, it's just, it's just gone. And that's a shame because I paid for it. It'd be good to know. And yeah, like what was I doing? So when I say space out the study sessions, I mean, maybe space them out a couple days, space them out a couple weeks, depending on the time course of things. but. Basically, just don't cram. Space out your study sessions. Bottom line. The second tip is to think about the material deeply. And that's really vague. What do I mean? 
So, another effect in cognitive psychology is the levels of processing effect. And in this, people remember information better the more deeply they've thought about it. What does deep mean? Deeply processing information means a couple things. The easiest is to make it personally relevant to you. So if you're talking about, I don't know, like history and big battles and the countries that we're fighting, you can make it personally relevant by bringing in your favorite TV show. If you're a fan of Game of Thrones, you might see some parallels between the different factions and what they're doing. Attach it. Like, yeah, this group is like the Lovejoys. This group is like Daenerys. Like, do what you can to make as many links there between things that are personally interesting and relevant to you and the material that you're trying to remember. Another way to get deep processing is to link that material to other things in whatever tests or class you're taking. So let's go through an example. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. All right, mitochondria. So if it's the powerhouse of the cell, let's think about that in a big scaled up city example. If the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, that means if it was in the city, it would be like a power plant and it would be powering other functions of the cell like X, Y, and Z. Or if it was a power plant, then the cell membrane would be like a wall around the city and try to think about the different parts of the cell as parts of a city. And you know, just try to build as many links as you can between the different pieces of information and you're giving yourself what are called retrieval cues. And these cues can help you remember the information later. So if you are sitting down at the test and you see something about cell membrane, I'm like, okay, yeah, I remember the cell membrane. It's like the city wall. And then later you get to the mitochondria, you've already sort of primed your memory to think of, that, think of it in that city analogy. And so you're already thinking about the mitochondria, the nucleus, all these other cell parts in that same context and hopefully with the attached meaning there as well. The third tip is basically instead of just rehashing the material like I was kind of harping on about earlier, test yourself. This is called the testing effect in psychology and basically people have better memory for things that they're tested on instead of things that they're not. And this seems a little counterintuitive maybe where you need to learn the material in order to be tested on it. So yes, you do need to do the reading, go to class, take notes, do what makes sense for you. But then when it comes time to study, make yourself a mock-up of the test. You can do what I did and in Word, basically just write out all the cues that you need. So the example that's relevant here, testing effect, spacing effect, levels of processing, blah, 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 blah. Leave space for answers, print off a handful of copies. And when I went to study, I would sit down and take my test write what I could, and then if I was uneasy on how much I knew it, like I might leave a note of like, uh, if this is right, I should still restudy it because I'm not too confident on it. And then pro tip, walk away from the test. Do laundry, study something else, just do something else, come back to the test before you grade it. When you come back, be honest. So this is kind of why I'm suggesting a printout version instead of flashcards, because with flashcards, you have the key thing and then you have the answer. It's really easy to like, hmm, yeah, this is whatever, flip it over. Oh no, that's totally what I meant. That's what I meant. I got this. And then treat it like you knew it. And so that's why I'm saying have a written copy of what you know and what you don't know so that you can basically be honest with your level of mastery over the material. So you've taken the test, you see where your weak points are, give it some time, restudy stuff, come back to it sometime later, do it again, take the test again. And you can do what's called a dropout sort of thing where if you get an answer correct like two or three times, you got it. Don't worry about that one in the future and just keep testing and retesting yourself on the material until you get to a point where you feel like you got it. Fourth 
is to test yourself in the ways that you know you'll be tested. So if you have a multiple choice test coming up, test yourself with multiple choice answers. If you have an essay test coming up, make sure you can write the essays that will be asked of you. Although I say this, but if you have to pick one type, go with something where you're having to completely generate the answers instead of recognizing it. Multiple choice tests rely on recognition. Basically, this means that you can pick it out from the potential answers. Short answer or long answer tests require recall. And recall is basically just pulling it out of your head in its entirety and getting it onto the test. Recall is harder than recognition. So if you're going to practice and you have limited time, go with the short answer or long answer mock-up test instead of the multiple choice. This way you're getting more bang for your buck in terms of studying power and also honestly coming up with multiple choice test questions, it's a pain. I adjuncted for years and that was like one of the worst parts of the job is writing the tests. Coming up with good multiple choice questions is hard. So save yourself some effort there and just give yourself the prompts that you have to respond to. But that's my opinion. For weird or unfamiliar things or actually anything that would fit into this format, use mnemonics. Mnemonics are basically strategies to try to help you remember information. Examples of these are things like acronyms, where you use letters as cues to remember information. The one that we mostly all learned in elementary school is Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Rough colors of the rainbow, roughly. Uh, the one that I was always afraid to say in class, but it's YouTube, I got from Comedy Central when I was in high school. And what was it? Kevin, please come over for gay sex. So you got kingdom, phylum, Kevin, please, class, order, come over, family, genus, species. I mean, it takes me a little bit to remember what they're for, but I still remember it and it's 20 years ago. So that mnemonics can really stick in your head. Another example is to use mental imagery. Sort of like I talked about earlier with the mitochondria as a powerhouse of the cell. Building up this imaginary city in your head does give you a lot of imagined visual things that can boost your memory later on. Another example of a mnemonic are rhyming things. I before E, except after C, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's a rough rule that works. Another mnemonic that you can do are songs. Uh, so I don't remember any, unfortunately. I don't think I ever used any. They were really popular for the biological psychology stuff. So brains, where you have to learn all the different parts of the brains and the nerves and all of that stuff. There were a bunch of songs to help you remember the different parts of the brain. So if you're in one of those courses, try to find those on YouTube, quite useful. Number six is to try to minimize interference between information whenever you can. Interference in this context is basically when you have other pieces of information that are kind of similar, but wrong for what you're going to be doing and could get you a wrong answer. So how do you do this? One way to minimize interference is to do your studying right before bed with the way memory encoding, so memories being laid down in memory, the way that works is it's really boosted by sleep and a lot of it happens during sleep. So if you study right before bedtime, you don't have any other information sort of sneaking in there and it will encode relatively pure. Another thing to be mindful of is if you have a couple classes that are confusable potentially, like French and Spanish, Space out when you're gonna study those. Don't just sit down and like, I'm gonna do my languages today. Space out the study sessions and that'll give you some ability to reduce interference between those topics.
In the last part of this video, I want to spend a little time talking about test anxiety. This is something that I had to deal with. Many of my students had to deal with. You're not alone if this is something that impacts you. I'm not of the opinion that this is something that you just have to grit your teeth and force your way through. There's ways you can kind of deal with it and we'll go through. So first is test day. You get your test and this is when the test anxiety typically hits. You flip through it and just feel like you don't know anything and you get a little bit of an anxiety spiral. I don't know this material. I'm going to flunk the test. Oh my God. Try answering a question. Oh my God. I don't know any of this. I'm going to flunk. Oh my God. <laughs> I've been there. Physics was not a good experience for me. So what do you do? You get your test, you read through it, front to back, every single question, read the test, set the test down and chill. I know this sounds counterproductive and that it's going to just take precious test time. It works. It works so much. I've had students who are averaging like C's and D's all of a sudden get A's. It works. It looks a little funny. It works. So as you're sitting there, relax. Think about a nice vacation. Think about puppies. Just relax. Get your heart rate down. Get your breathing down. Get your mental state back into kind of a neutral place. Maybe let some of the class lectures come back to you. Like don't fight away memories, but just relax. And when you're relaxed, it usually took the students that this helped five minutes, then begin taking the test. Go through in this calm, chill state. You got this. You did the studying we talked about. You've got this. Now you just need to keep the test anxiety from blocking the answers for you. So you're taking the test. If you feel it start to creep back up, take another 30 seconds. Um, the students I saw do this, it was a little weird. So if you do end up employing this, maybe let the instructor, teacher, professor, whoever know, because usually when I saw it, it was a couple students sitting there just, hmm. And granted, that is not what cheating looks like, but if I didn't know that's what they were doing, I probably would have gone and talked to them and like, are you okay? Are you, is everything okay? <laughs> Which would probably make the test anxiety worse. So if you are going to do this one, give the instructor a heads up. Um, but absolutely, it does help. Just having that initial panic, let it wash away you will remain with your knowledge to rock that test. Another thing you can do is, it's less good than some things, but it might help. So if you get into that really anxious state when you take a test, try to mimic that state when you're taking your mock tests at home. If you do know that you're just going to be a hyperventilating mess taking the test, it might be worthwhile getting a little bit heightened breath, heightened arousal while you're taking that pre-test. So you're at least in a kind of similar state. And also that way you've practiced retrieval of this information under duress. And so it'll be easier when you have to do it in the future. Please try method one before method two, please. The last thing I want to say about test anxiety here is if it's really bad, if it's even kind of bad, see what options your student services, union, whatever it's called at your school might have available for you. I had a handful of students every semester who had anxiety demonstrable enough, I'm not sure what the criteria were, where they got their test in a special room that was quiet away from the class and they got somewhere between 15 to 30 extra minutes because of the test anxiety. So they would have time to have that initial panic reaction 
come back to a centered, calm state, and then take the test. So if you do have test anxiety and just the five minutes or whatever doesn't seem to be enough, talk to student services in your school and see if any accommodations can be made for you. So those are my tips based on cognitive psychology research and personal experience that will hopefully help your testing go better and your learning be a more efficient process, maybe even fun. And hopefully these tips help you. If you have any tips that you would like to share with others, the comments are open. If you have questions about studying, feel free to hit me up in the comments or on Twitter. I'll have the Twitter in the outro of the video and it's also linked below as are citations for all of the techniques I talked about today. If you're curious and want to get practice reading scientific papers, they'll be there. And that's it for this video. See you guys in the next one.